Political struggle has given way to armed rebellion. Saint-Denis is only the first in a series of bloody confrontations. The rebellion will spread all the way to Upper Canada. Hundreds of men will fall on the battlefields, and the fate of Canada hangs in the balance. In the autumn of 1837, armed conflict erupts after years of political struggle. At Saint-Denis, the Patriot win an unexpected victory. Encouraged by this, rebels in Upper Canada decide to march on Toronto. Would you live and die a slave? These men are desperate to win what they have dreamed of for years. The right to govern themselves. November 25th, 1837. The British Army is determined to crush the Patriot resistance. The fate of the rebellion will be decided at Saint-Charles in the Richelieu Valley. Jean-Philippe Boucher-Belleville is one of the 250 rebels. We were on the defensive, there was no doubt about it. And for us, the whole question came down to this. Were we to yield up our property, our women and children, to a horde of barbarians without so much as a struggle? To barbarians who had come not to obey the law, but to plunder us by fire and sword and fill their own pockets. Charles Beauclerk is one of the officers in command of 425 British soldiers at Saint-Charles. Colonel Wetherall hoped that a display of his force would induce some defection among the infatuated people. But unfortunately for the sake of humanity, it was far otherwise. This gave rise to an order for the three center companies to fix bayonets and charge the works. Company! Experience! To the front! Search! Covered by their comrades fire, the Royal Scots, one of Britain's fiercest regiments, close ranks and advance on the barricade. After two straight hours of continuous gunfire from both sides, the troops charged with bayonets. We had no weapons suitable for close-range combat, and so we had to abandon the field to them. of the Patriots surrender. Lieutenant! Sir! Move your platoon forward and take care of the prisoners! But others refuse to admit defeat.
Battle of Saint-Charles ends in a bloodbath. 150 Patriot are killed and only seven British soldiers. News of the clash in the Richelieu Valley reaches Upper Canada. William Lyon Mackenzie is convinced the time is ripe to attack Toronto. In the absence of British troops, he hopes to seize power and form a provisional government. Most of Mackenzie's followers are disaffected farmers. He summons them to Montgomery's Tavern, a few miles north of Toronto. December 4th, only 150 men have answered Mackenzie's call. They are tired, famished, and poorly organized. Little Mac conducted himself like a crazy man all the time we're at Montgomery's. He went about storming and screaming like a lunatic, and many of us felt certain he was not in his right senses. Mackenzie's second-in-command is the surveyor and blacksmith Samuel Lount. They argue late into the night, unable to agree on a plan of attack. The next day, Mackenzie and Lout decide to act. Twenty militiamen, loyal to the British Crown, are waiting for them along Young Street. Colonel Lount and those in the front fired. Instead of stepping to one side to make room for those behind to fire, fell flat on their faces. The next rank did the same thing. Many of the country people, when they saw the riflemen falling down and heard the firing, they imagined that those that fell were killed by the enemy's fire and took to their heels. Stop! We can take the city! Where are you going? Come back! Stand your ground, man! Stand your ground! The city would have been ours. In an hour. Probably without firing a shot. <laughs> but 800 ran. And unfortunately, the wrong way. The Queen Two days later, a thousand militiamen and volunteers are issued arms and ammunition. They are ordered to oust the rebels from Montgomery's Tavern. This time, it is Mackenzie's men who are waiting on Young Street. Half the rebels have firearms, the rest have only pikes and cudgels. is brief. The rebels drop their weapons and flee. Stand your ground! Stand your ground! Militiamen and volunteers ransack Montgomery's tavern and put it to the torch.
Mackenzie, along with some of his comrades, makes his way to the United States. But others are not so lucky. Samuel Lump and Peter Matthews are hanged in front of the Toronto jail four months later. The rebellion in Upper Canada has lasted less than a week. In Lower Canada, armed rebels prepare for one last stand in the county of two mountains northwest of Montreal. On December 14th, 1837, General John Colburn himself leads an expedition to the village of Saint-Houstache. Young Emily Berthelot watches his arrival. At 10 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday, a cold, clear, beautiful day, the English troops march down the King's Road, 1,500 strong. Infantry, artillery, cavalry, the officers in full dress regalia. The entire parade filed by at a leisurely pace with a kind of defiance. For most of the Patriot, resistance against such a force seems impossible. They retreat. But one of the Patriot leaders, Dr. Jean-Olivier Chenier, is determined to fight back. He and a few dozen men occupy the village church. General Colburn orders his artillery to fire on the Patriot stronghold. The siege is underway. Parish priest Jacques Paquin witnesses the cannonade. All the cannons began firing together, battering the church with astonishing rapidity. The masonry was extremely solid and resisted a tremendous number of cannonballs as they were fired off one after the other. The church holds out against the cannon fire for two hours. dusk, General Colburn orders a detachment of the Royal Scots to dislodge the Patriot from their fortress at all costs. Among them, Lieutenant License. We got round to the back of the church and found a small door leading into the sacristy, which we battered in. We then turned to our left and went into the main body of the church. Here the rebels began firing down our heads. We could not get up to them, for the staircases were broken down. So Ormsby lighted a fire behind the altar and got his men out. Father Paquin recounts the last moments of the battle. Dr. Chenier saw that he could no longer defend himself from inside the church, for it had completely succumbed to the flames. He gathered up several of his men and jumped out of the windows with them. He was trying to escape, but he could not get out of the cemetery and was soon struck by a bullet and collapsed. He died almost immediately. Seventy Patriot and three soldiers are dead. In the days following, soldiers and volunteers take revenge, terrorizing the county of Two Mountains. 
Some of the rebels try to make it to the American border, but hundreds are taken prisoner. Dr. Wolfred Nelson and the journalist Jean-Philippe Boucher-Belleville are among them. Exiled in the United States, Louis-Joseph Papineau writes to his wife, Julie. My dear, cherished wife, in my flight, I escaped so many and such close dangers felt such tormenting anguish at the sight of the misfortunes of my country, my family, my friends. I sometimes think, in spite of the immense disasters suffered, that Providence will one day shine on us, liberating our unfortunate country and uniting our family once again. When your letter arrived, telling us that our future is as uncertain as the prison, I was utterly disheartened. Now that martial law has been reinstated, and that the troops to be deployed throughout the countryside have arrived, I'm terribly afraid that we are to have our share of troubles, just as we had for a good part of the winter. <laughs> 